Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Walter Falcon. I'm Dir Deputy Director of the Center for Food Security and the Environment. It's my pleasure to welcome you here. We have a bit of a role reversal today. Usually, the lady who stands before you and who moderates is, in fact, the speaker today, and more about her later. And so I'll be moderating the event uh, this afternoon. For regulars to this series, you will know that this is the eighth in a series of projected 12 uh, seminars dealing with food security and food policy, particularly as it relates to Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. This is a Gates-sponsored series, and it is designed both to provide the audience here in Stanford with what we hope are new and interesting ideas, and to be videotaped and used in distance learning for those in graduate schools in, in Africa and Asia. So when you are preparing your brief, piercing questions uh, that are to come in the Q&A session, uh, please remember that you have the responsibility of asking questions for those in Africa uh, and, and Asia as well. Our topic this afternoon is biofuels and the changing nature of the structure of demand for commodities as they relate to, to food and energy. And we're pleased to have Roz Naylor and, and Siwa Mazungi uh, with us this afternoon. Let me introduce both of them to you at the outset and then they can proceed uninterrupted. Many of you in the audience know Roz. Uh, she has multiple titles, as you can see up there, insofar as I know only one paycheck, but multiple titles, uh, which, which you can read. Uh, she's a well-known figure on, on, on campus. Those of us who know and work with her, I think recognize her for three special characteristics. One is her unbounded energy the likes of most of, of which most of us have never seen. It is rumored that the Energizer Bunny intern here for one day and, and gave up because he couldn't keep up with her. Uh, there may be truth to that. So her energy. Second of all, for her great capacity to synthesize and analyze materials from the physical sciences, the biological sciences, and the social sciences together in very policy relevant ways. It's a rare skill and she does that superbly. And third, most of us envy her as just surely as a writer. She is one of the few economists that I know who might actually be able to make a living as a writer. Now that is high praise in, indeed. Roz has many characteristics she did an undergraduate degree at, at, at Colorado, a master's degree at LSE, her PhD in applied economics here at Stanford in 1989, then went to work immediately for what is now the Freeman Spogli Institute. When you look at her writings, and you will find them as likely in science and nature as in world development or the American Journal of Agricultural Economics, you will find that she's interknown, internationally known for her work in aquaculture, uh, for, for her work on defining what we really mean by food security, on price volatility, on land and water development in Africa, and for the last five years, particularly in, in the area of, of biofuels. And we're in for a treat this afternoon as she speaks to that topic. She'll be followed by Siwa Mazongi. Siwa, we're glad to welcome you back to Stanford, too. Steve, uh, Siwa has a master's degree from uh, the same institution where Roz got her PhD, the old Food Research Institute. We were talking yesterday. We believe that Siwa is the next to the last person ever to have gotten a degree uh, uh, from, from food research. It's nice to have you back. He, uh, he Siwa was born in Tanzania, grew up in Nairobi, 
the son of university parents at the, at the University of Nairobi there. Uh, came here for his master's, as I said, then went on to Davis, uh, where he did his PhD. And then in 2004, he went to work for one of our sister organizations in Washington, the International Food Policy Research Institute, typically known as IFPRI in, in Washington, D.C. He's there a senior research fellow, works on a variety of topics. He shares with Roz an interest in marine and, and, and fish issues there. He works on ground and surface water issues in Asia. He's written on production and trade. And for the last three years, he has been a collaborator with us. IFPRI and, and Stanford joined, uh, shared a, a large uh, proposal, a large grant in the area of biofuels, and Siwa has run the IFPRI uh, side of that. So Siwa, we're glad to welcome you here as well and to hear your comments. And then, without further ado, I think, I should simply ask you to join me in welcoming Roz Naylor to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Wally, and welcome to all of you um, to the symposium. I'm particularly happy to be sharing the podium with Siwa today because he knows so much about this topic that any really tough questions that you ask, I'm just going to delegate to him. So anyway, we're really excited to be able to talk to you today about biofuels, rural development, and the changing nature of agricultural demand. And before I get started, I just wanted to thank some of our funders in this area. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has funded our large biofuels project. Lawrence and Tricia Kemp have funded some work in this area. And GSEF has also funded work um, for the Center on Food Security and, and the Environment in this area. There's a whole host of my um, colleagues in the Center on Food Security and the Environment that I also want to thank who I've list listed here. And um, I will say that any mistakes in the presentation are probably their fault and not mine. <laughs> so I'm really thrilled to be um, talking to this distance learning um, group as well in Africa and South Asia. And I was thinking back to when I was doing my graduate training in economics and agricultural development. Um, trying pretty in, inefficiently and uh, perhaps ineffectively to learn from farmers what was actually going on in the field. Um, but I actually did learn um, sorry, quite a bit um, from this book, Food Policy Analysis, which was authored by Peter Timmer and Wally Falcon and Scott Pearson, which um, really is sort of the, the Bible of this field of food policy analysis and has remained unbelievably relevant over the years. We still use it in our class, for example and translated into at least half a dozen languages, including Vietnamese. Um, and, and, it's, and it's so pertinent still, but there are a few really critical things that have changed since this book was written. And one of them is this link, the integration between the agricultural sector and the energy sector. And ag energy has always been connected, obviously, through inputs into agriculture, the fuel inputs into agriculture, but now, um, Agriculture is actually a contribution to the energy sector and uh, a rapidly rising one. This is the growth in biofuels production from 75 to 2010. And you can see, particularly in this recent period um, from about 2006, very rapid rise. The green is the ethanol, the blue is the biodiesel, um, over 30 billion uh, gallons now, most of which is in ethanol. And when we look at this growth, most of what we see today is in conventional or first generation um, ethanol sources. And these are the food crops that we actually rely on um, for our own food and feed consumption. So on the ethanol side, it's primarily uh, maize, and I'll use maize and corn interchangeably in this talk, maize and sugar. And on the oil side, it's mainly rapeseed, which also canola. And then a host of other oils. I'm going to highlight some of the uh, jatropha, which is here in Africa, as an emerging source, not yet a major source, but an important one for Africa. So um, these are some of the major sources that I'm going to be talking about, but certainly not the only ones that feed into this sector. Oil palm here is an incredibly productive source of vegetable oils that can be used as a biodiesel if it's economically viable. And you can see just from this picture 
very large implications for land use change, particularly in the tropics. And this is Indonesia, the largest producer here. Uh, soybeans are also um, an emerging biodiesel. The US is trying to promote this, for example. But there's other more minor ones. Uh, this is sweet sorghum, which is in uh, Africa and India. Cassava, which is in Thailand for the Chinese market. And cassava is also a major food staple in Africa. So we're talking about a whole range of different food commodities. And when we talk about biofuels, we're either going to talk about these first generation, which are the ones that I've just shown you here, um, or moving towards the second generation, which is the cellulosic-based fuels, which are coming from either ag residue or dedicated you know, energy crops like switchgrass or poplar. And then you have um, the third generation, which is mainly from algae. And I'm not going to talk a lot about that in this presentation. This is an example of an algae farm um, that would be needed at scale. And it's incredibly water and energy and land intensive, um, not economically viable today. But I wanted to give you a vision of what it might look like in the future. So today, I want to focus specifically on first generation biofuels. And I want to focus um, particularly on the role of policy in biofuel development. And then um, because of the nature of this symposium, I'm also going to focus on food security implications in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, particularly India. So when we're talking about um, food security, what I'm talking about is availability or the production, the pile of grain, access or the ability of people to afford to buy food, and utilization, which is the nutrient part, what nutrients people are getting. Uh, but another important aspect of food security is the stability, both in the output and in the price. And most of the discussion tends to focus around the product markets, these commodity markets themselves. But I'm also going to talk about the factor markets, what's happening to land, labor, and water. Uh, go from global to local scales, economy to household. And you're wondering, how are we going to do this in 45 minutes? Well, or an hour, actually. Um, you'll see. We'll, we'll get there. So. Uh, <laughs> So when we talk about biofuels and food security, the, three, the way I'm breaking out this talk is first I'm going to focus on uh, the role of biofuels policy, spe specifically mandates in the United States and in the EU, um, the role that they play on global food prices, uh, the level and the variability. So it's kind of a global commodity price view. And then I'm going to move on to the role of biofuels for energy security, rural development, and food security in Africa and South Asia. And in the process of this, focus on the land, labor, and water markets as part of it. So when we look at the ethanol, and the ethanol is um, the, you know, the big green growth here, ethanol is really a story about US and Brazil. You know, they account for almost all of it. In 2010, US was 57% of the market, and Brazil was 33% of the market. Uh, despite the incredible development in ethanol that Brazil has had in the past, the U.S., with our policy impetus, has just sped right by. And we're at a really interesting balance with Brazil right now. Uh, other countries, China, Canada, France, Germany, you know, less than 2.5% each of this market. Uh, biodiesel, by comparison, has uh, many more players. And you can see a lot of European players here, Indonesia with palm oil. Um, we have uh, the U.S. with soy. There's a number of different players on the biodiesel. And as I showed you in the earlier frame, it was a bit smaller, but it's increasing quite rapidly. So here we're talking about rapeseed, soy, palm oil, other fats and oils, including jatropha. So this is just by means of background. And to give you some context, no pun intended, but what is driving the demand for all this biodiesel, biofuels? And um, What's really driving the demand is income growth primarily is, is one area. And we just look at the unbelievable income growth we're seeing in China, India, other emerging economies, the kind of fleets that are coming on to the roads right now. And this graph shows per capita income. It's on a logarithmic scale um, measured against in the dark lines uh, per capita cereal consumption and the light dots per capita energy consumption. And the difference between these two is striking because over time, with income growth, you know, food uh, demand for food tapers off. It's called Engel's Law. Over time, the share of what people are spending on food is going to taper off. But it's not true at all for energy. And in fact, that demand is so robust um, that you know, we're really going to be seeing a huge demand and increasing demand for energy, of which agriculture is going to play a role. So this is China. You know, people like to say filling up the gas tank of one of these SUVs 
would take enough corn to feed an African for a year. That's a kind of a typical analogy if you go through the calculations. But China has some mandates, Philippines and other countries have mandates. We also, of course, have population growth heading towards 9 billion people or more on the planet. Prices, looking at the relative prices of um, agricultural commodities and biofuels to fossil fuels. And the last big P is policy. And uh, the thing that hasn't changed since food policy analysis was written is the unbelievable dominance of policy in agriculture and agricultural activities, of which this is certainly one of them. So when we look at the policy debate, um, you know, one of the first features of the debate is what we saw in the past prior to um, this biofuels boom. From 1950, you know, the mid-1950s to, you know, sort of the mid-2000s, we had declining real prices for cereals. This is wheat and corn in inflation-adjusted terms. Uh, declining real prices on trend, and this was due in part because of our subsidies and our surpluses and dumping more into the market for the US and Europe and other countries, bringing prices down. And of course, we had this big blip in the 1970s, but on trend, it went, has been going down. So the debate you know, prior to about 2005 was, what do we do about such low agricultural prices? These poor farmers around the world can't survive and so forth. So that was part of the debate. And I think the US reaction was, OK, well, if we're going to subsidize so much, let's, let's subsidize with something we can use and put it into our gas tanks. And so let's revitalize our own rural economy in a way that's useful for our energy economy, too. And so the question with this blip in here, is this going to go up in the future, or is it just a blip? Um, it's not the only debate. Of course, on the biofuels investment and policy in the United States, we think about how do we wean ourselves off fossil fuels and all the rogue countries like Iran and so forth that are controlling these resources. How do we um, really deal with the greenhouse gas emissions of being in a fossil fuel economy? And there's a lot of debate as to whether biofuels, in fact, does better or worse in the greenhouse gas balance. And of course, there's the debate about, well, maybe we should do this because then prices will increase and all these poor farmers and these agricultural communities uh, will be able to survive and we can get, get out of a situation of extreme malnutrition that we have here in these agricultural communities. And of course, the flip side is, now with very high prices, is this food security situation worse? So I would say none of these debates are resolved, but they're all out there in a very strong way. So um, let me start with U.S. policy, and I'm going to focus a lot on how U.S. policy itself is driving so much of this. You know, we had, in 2007, the Energy Independence and Security Act, and then the Renewable Fuel Standard that came after that and was revised in 2010. And the main part of this, which I think is so significant, is the use of mandates. We have a mandate to use renewable fuels in our transportation fleet, um, rising from 12.5 billion gallons in 2010 to um, 36 billion gallons in 2022. And 15 billion gallons of this has to be from first generation biofuels, um, a la corn, in the United States. The remaining 21 bi billion gallons is from advanced biofuels, and one, 1 billion gallons from biodiesel is part of that. The other important shift that we saw was the EPA phased out the use of MTBE as an oxygenate additive in uh, gasoline in 2001, in 2005 for health reasons and environmental reasons. Um, and ethanol has been used as a replacement. And so when we think about E5 gasoline, you know, we already had 5% um, of about 140 billion gallons that would go directly into ethanol. We had an immediate market for this. And this is also changing over time. And so this is essentially what the, the schedule looks like, billions of gallons here, 2006 up to 2022, when we'll have 36 billion gallons. 15 is coming from the conventional biofuels. The blue is the advanced cellulosic. The uh, green is other advanced. And, and the 1 billion at the top in the red is the biodiesel. So um, how are we, we going to proceed here? Um, U.S. biofuels policy has been supported in addition to mandates with a whole host of credits, tax breaks, and so forth that were completely repealed and ended at the end of 2011. So we don't have those anymore. Um, really, so many of those were going to big oil companies and were in a budget discussion here in the United States. It was really hard to justify them. 
But the other major policy to keep in mind, um, we have a Renewable Fuels Marketing Act where the EPA did increase the allowance uh, to E15 in um, a large share of our more recent car fleets. And so that does open up the market for much more um, of the renewable fuels, the biofuels that we're producing here. The other important thing that really throws some twists in the market with our renewable fuel standard is that EPA is actually trying to regulate biofuels with life cycle analysis, including indirect land use change. So if you're going to pull um, palm oil out of, the Indonesian out of the Indonesian rainforest and put it into the biodiesel, you're going to have to account for all the carbon that was emitted by clearing out the rainforest and planting it there and so forth. So EPA has taken a massive step in trying to do this with life cycle analysis. This is a huge area of debate, I should say. But the actual um, regulations show that biofuels have to be 20% lower in life cycle analysis, greenhouse gas emissions, relative to gasoline. And that in includes indirect land use. So corn um, ethanol, if it's done in more modern natural gas-fired plants, actually does meet this 20%. And so it really ensures our uh, ability to get up to the 15 billion gallon mandate there. Um, by 2022, it actually says that 20 billion gallons has to come from sources that are 50% lower in greenhouse gas emissions So that's than, than standard gasoline. So that's quite a bit more. And the most interesting part of this for me is that um, it includes sugar-based ethanol from Brazil. And so if you read the Financial Times yesterday and you saw, okay, actually the U.S. now exports ethanol to Brazil, but now because of this this regulation, uh, we're at the same time importing ethanol from Brazil. <laughs> so it's not the most efficient if you think about all the transportation costs and the greenhouse gases associated with that. But we can talk about that as we go along. Um, what all this has meant, in fact, is that uh, U.S. is now the, using 40% uh, of the corn that U.S. consumes is going into ethanol. Um, it's exceeded what we use in livestock for the first time on record. And so you may say, well, what are the implications for the livestock sector? I mean, what are the, um, the livestock sector lobbies doing about this, and aren't they upset? So we're seeing a big shift in utilization. And if you think about the U.S. actually supplying 55% of the world market in corn, the fact that we're using so much in our gas tanks really is changing the nature of global markets in ways that I'll mention in just a minute. So um, when we look at the livestock sector, though, it's not the end of the story. And I want to just mention in one slide the, uh, the byproducts issue. Because in fact, corn that's designated for ethanol production returns about 30% of its weight to the livestock sector, um, either in wet distiller grains or in dry distiller grains. And in fact, those distiller grains account for about 15 to 20% of the total revenue from ethanol production. So if you didn't have that byproduct, um, the, the profitability of this would be, in fact, much lower. Um, and if you ignore all these byproducts, in fact, the impacts that you're looking at prices, land use, and so forth um, are quite different. And this is some work Tom Hurdle and others have done. Um, but I, I'll mention it once. It'll apply to all of the biofuels that I'm actually talking about. Um, EU is also has mandates in their policy. They have a target of 10% transportation fuels by 2020. Uh, the different countries can implement in whatever the way they want through subsidies or fines. Um, and this just shows all of the EU countries, you know, a whole range of different approaches that they have. A recent report coming out of the um, EU, which Eric just recently shared with me, um, is much more controversial on the greenhouse gas side of this in terms of whether we can actually quantify this and whether it will be a net plus or a net minus. Um, in any case, EU is looking for mandates as well, and so, um, or using mandates. So why do mandates matter? Like, why am I talking about this so much? When you have mandates, you have a quantity that you're um, absolutely insisting you use, regardless, really, of the price. You get a more inelastic demand curves for that commodity. And so um, here, you can just see this is a demand curve. I'm bringing you back to your Econ 101 uh, courses. Um, the demand curve without biofuels, and of course, when you shift to uh, using um, grain for food and feed and now fuel, you're going to shift it out um, and increase the demand, but also make it less elastic because of these mandates. And so 
um, you're not only increasing the price level here um, from P0 to P2, but if you have any kind of supply shock, say you have a drought, an extreme drought that, that decreases supply, any kind of demand shock will then amplify the price variability or price volatility that you see when you have more inelastic demand. And so um, this really leads to some of the volatility questions we've talked about in this series and we'll talk about more today. So why do mandates matter? It increases grain and oilseed price levels and, and volatility. It also reduces the stock of these commodities and creates a lot of price expectations in the market that can also fuel more price increases. Um, it's, it's creating uh, de import demand for feedstocks if, if that mandate can't be met fully within the EU or within the United States. And so I'm going to move to Africa and say, you know, does Africa have a market here that they can export to? It increases land values, leads to rural growth. So there's all sorts of effects. And one of our questions is, what does it really mean for food security? So we've got these volatile commodity prices. This is um, wheat, maize, rice, soybeans, and palm in the different colors, and then uh, crude oil in the black. In, in real, these are in real inflation-adjusted terms bouncing all around um, since 1970, when this series begins to um, January of 2012. And so if we look at this recent period, what's causing all this volatility? We've had Peter Timmer was here talking about controlling volatility or adjusting to it. What's really uh, causing it here? And there's a whole number of variables that are brought to bear on global price volatility. We have livestock demand increasing, particularly from China. Currency, US currency bouncing around, a lot of supply shocks from weather. Um, speculation is in the news all the time stocks, energy prices, and of course, US ethanol policy. And I really want to focus um, my comments on these last three, stocks, energy prices, and the US ethanol policy. So when we look at what's happening to stocks, and stocks are that buffer that holds from one season to the next, and it really drives a lot of price expectations. Because if stocks um, to use, to consumption, go below about 20%, Traders start getting nervous. You see, start seeing prices go up. And actually, governments get pretty worried about whether they're going to have enough buffer in the system um, to maintain some stable price level. So you see um, in 2012 projections by the USDA at the end of last year, you know, wheat stocks were at about 31% of uh, use. Soy and rice were at about 22%. And corn is down here at 14%, way below that threshold where markets start getting really nervous. And in fact, um, just at the end of March, the USDA came out with announcement. What's been happening in recent years is the USDA announces quite a high stock, like they're trying to calm the markets down, and then people start wondering, OK, is it really that high or really that low? This year, US, they just came out and said stocks are lower than we all thought. And the markets just uh, went to limit. You know, They just went up to the maximum amount that they could be traded. And you see a lot of speculation driven off this. But a lot of this stock decline itself is um, due to uh, the use in ethanol, in fact. The second uh, link is to the energy prices. And we all know that crude and oil is linked now very tightly to corn. Um, this goes from 1980 to the current period, and, um, to, the, to 2011, the end of 2011. And you can see um, between 1980 and 2005, no correlation really at all. You know, everything's just bouncing around. The green is the corn, and the black is the oil. But from 2006 to 2011, uh, the correlation gets much stronger, 0.77. And you see these uh, commodities moving quite closely together. Now, those of you who have good eyesight um, will see, actually, there is some asymmetry here. Um, if you think about it, um, the energy sector is this massive sector. And agriculture is contributing about 4% of global transportation fuels right now. So what agriculture contributes to it is still very small. So agriculture is never really going to drive energy prices. But energy prices do drive agriculture. And so when energy prices are rising, you see commodity prices going up, like corn prices going up. And when they fall, it goes a little under, under disarray. So it's, it's an interesting asymmetry that a lot of uh, analysts are studying now. Um, but what's interesting to me is that the crude is now kind of setting this floor price and a ceiling price for the commodity in question. And um, this is also 
a period 2006 to April 2011 when you had a low energy price, a low crude price of 40 and a high of about 140. And um, on the low side, there's just so much energy demand and with mandates, it's going to set kind of a, a lower limit to where, where crop prices, where corn prices are gonna go. But on the upper side, um, because corn depends on the uh, processing plant, but is over half of the costs of bioethanol, um, if, if corn prices get too high and it sometimes can get up to 70% or more, um, you know, then, then it's not going to be profitable. No one will use it and prices will come down again. And so there is this whole notion of this parity price now uh, between, you know, the break-even price, which sets corn in relation to crude oil, processing costs, feedstock, um, and exchange rates. So, so we're seeing these really tightly linked now. Um, what's interesting as we look forward, and I've had some debates, David LaBelle and I have talked about it a little bit, and Tom Hurdle, you know, what is the future of biofuels? Where, where is this all going right now? And what's interesting is the decoupling that we've seen between crude oil and natural gas in recent years, since 2009, since particularly once we started doing the hydraulic fracking, putting a lot more natural gas in the markets. Um, th these are much more decoupled. And so when we look to the future, you know, it could be that crude oil prices stay higher, go much higher, while natural gas prices continue to go down. And what this means, in fact, for the biofuel business, this is, uh, those were futures prices for those two. This is natural gas costs per bushel of corn processed at an Iowa plant. So it's like, how, you know, how much does it make, make a difference to the profitability? And at a high point, it's gone from a dollar per bushel down to like 40 cents or less. And so now ethanol processing costs are much lower. Producing fertilizer is much lower. So ethanol really can become much more profitable now with this decoupling. Um, and in fact, when you look at the returns on investment, they're now back up at about 15%. Uh, they took a dip in 2008, 2009, but they're going right back up again. So it could be very profitable. And I guess we have to ask, you know, what is the whole transportation fleet around natural gas? Um, that would be another question we can talk about. Um, the last point on the oil side that I think is interesting is um, we really need to think about the relative price of biofuels to crude oil. And if we actually map um, that on the, on the y-axis, um, and then the quantity of biofuels demanded, it gives us kind of an interesting story because if you had a very serious disruption in oil markets, say the Strait of Hormuz was you know, blocked and oil prices doubled, this could become so elastic over time, there could be so much demand and so much profitability in biofuels that you could keep shifting out, keep supplying more and more without any real decrease in the uh, profitability. And so that's another scenario we could be heading at and we'll be interested to see where you think things are going. But the, but the last of the three on the, uh, on the volatility is, of course, just ethanol policy itself. Wally Falcon and I wrote a piece on the global cost of American ethanol. And up at the top there, it says, our, our view was US ethanol policy may be the single most significant contributor to world food price, food price instability. There's also a quote in the paper that says, Mess up the corn market and you pretty much mess up everything. Anonymous, but it sure sounds like Wally Falcon to me. <laughs> but it wasn't anonymous, you know. Um, and, you know, this is what the corn prices look like. Um, over a period of going back all the way to 1913, they've always been <laughs> bouncing around in inflation adjusted terms. But they have been coming down on trend. And the question is this last period, are they going up for, for good or, or what's happening here? Um, these prices of corn ripple through all of the world food economy markets. It affects its own demand, you know, the demand for corn, the supply of corn, but all of these cross-price effects. It affects the demand and supply of wheat and, may, or wheat and rice and soy and other things. And so, um, so there's a lot of economy-wide effects and agricultural-wide effects that go on. And when all of these food prices, especially for the staples, are affected, um, it has big income effects. You know, increased food prices really do hurt household budgets, particularly if you're really poor and you're spending 70, 80 percent of your household budget on food. You're going to be hurt the most in that circumstances if prices spike up like they've been spiking. And this is actually referred to as Timmer's Law in, in our field. Um, so let me give you a non-jargony uh, way of looking at this. 
you know, if we actually look at the U.S. corn-based ethanol and we see the prices that are going up and the demand by the biofuel sector, you know, U.S. farmers are growing more corn, less soy, and the prices of soy, you know, the expected prices are going to go up. Brazil has been taking a greater share of that market. And you've been seeing a lot of land use change associated with that. So that's one sort of a ripple effect that we're seeing. But as the demand for corn rises, not only for food and feed, but also for fuel, you know, prices are going up. And wheat starts going, substituting for corn and livestock feed. In fact, um, the current prices are so close. You know, usually wheat's quite a bit more expensive than corn, but now they're so close, there's likely a lot of wheat is going to go into livestock feed now. But as wheat prices rise, then poorer consumers who might eat bread or rice are going to eat more rice and less bread if that's more expensive, and then rice prices are going to rise. So it's these, you know, it's all the linkages through these ripple effects that you see. And you also see corn capitalized into land values. I mean, land values in this country have become astronomical. Um, here, this is the corn belt. Um, $3,000 a hectare or, or an acre is the average, but in many states, you know, it's up to $4,000 an acre, much higher, you know, than, than in the past. This was a blip in 1980 that was an incredibly speculative blip, very high interest rates and a lot of capitalization and debt in the system. Um, and and this, this one is quite different. This is um, a lot of fundamentals at the base of this. There's huge expected returns in agriculture in this country. The supply chains are there. People are farming the land that they're buying. There's not a lot of land for sale. And it's a good investment relative to financial investments, which are you know, yielding much lower rates, unless you're specifically, say, in the energy sector. So, so it's interesting. We're seeing it capitalized now into land values. And this picture is very different than what we're going to see shortly in, um, in the Africa context. Another set, just to give you a, a feel for, because these all happen simultaneously. It's not just like US is doing its corn-based ethanol and nothing else is happening in the world. In fact, EU is producing and using more rapeseed or canola in their fuels. The prices also have been rising. China used to import a lot of rapeseed for cooking oil, but now it's not importing as much, and it's starting to use more soy oil and more palm oil from Indonesia, for example. You're seeing those kind of effects. China itself has a fairly active biofuels market, and it doesn't want to touch its own staple commodities, so it's importing from elsewhere. So cassava from Southeast Asia or uh, jatropha from Africa. In fact, this, oops, uh, this picture here is its first um, test project of a biofuel jet um, that, is, that is fueled by jatropha oil. So <laughs> if we're moving towards our jet, I don't know if any of you get on planes and you've seen um, part of the oil is now coming from biofuels. So you're starting to see this a lot on, on aircraft now. Um, China's going that way too. And so um, this is, you know, really could fuel a lot of speculation in land markets around the world, area expansion, a lot of shift from food to fuel. And so we're seeing these real global effects. Um, a lot of these, because it's so complicated, I'm trying to show a complicated story in words, but um, Tom Hurdle and others, uh, you know, build computable general equilibrium model. CWA is building a number of these to try to capture all of the global uh, commodity effects as they're linked to through product markets and factor markets and, and the whole economy. So there's a lot of different ways to analyze this. What's been happening on the land front, though, is really interesting. If you look at 2010, 2011 relative to 2005, 6 when at least the U.S. really started getting into the biofuel sector, we've seen 38 million hectares of these um, key crops expanding. And you can see most of the expansion is in corn, soybeans, rapeseed, and then some of the substitutes, rice and wheat. And so um, it's really interesting to see that 70% of that expansion is in area expansion. And 30 is just crop substitution going out of these other crops and into the uh, bigger commodities. Um, what's more interesting from my point of view, actually, is that 85% of the expansion is occurring in only six regions. China, Sub-Saharan Africa, former Soviet Union, Argentina, India, and Brazil, in that order, actually. And so I was thinking, China, you know, what's going on in China? Well, China's um, producing a lot more corn up in the northern areas now, and mainly for livestock feed, but they're looking at a market that's, they're getting in line behind biofuels and a lot of other demands that are out there. And so it's really interesting to see the kind of land use changes that are going to occur 
along the way here. So let me just wrap up this first section by you know, reiterating, you know, we've definitely seen a rise in price levels for grains and oil seeds, and a decline in both the production and the price stability of those commodities um, that are used as biofuel feedstocks with ripple effects throughout the whole economy. And so really want to think carefully, what does it mean for food security? One, the availability, just the sheer amount of food staples that we have for food and feed as opposed to fuel in the future. But also access, you know, what is the price going to be and how is it going to affect incomes of the poorest to be able to buy it? And how stable is it going to be? You know, price shocks really hurt the poor. So, so let me go on now and move into these countries. You know, if we go from global markets down to national markets and then to local economies, there goes through a lot of transmission effects in your analysis. First, you've got to deal with exchange rates. Those can be all over the place. This gets to be much more country by country specific. And you have to worry about what policies are in place in each country um, that are either importing or exporting these commodities. And uh, in the Peter Timmers symposium series, we talked about countries trying to um, put in place policies to stabilize markets. And Tom Jane also talked about that in Africa. We see a lot of different policies there. Uh, once we have a price in domestic markets, how is it going to go down at the household level? It really depends on what infrastructure you have in place, roads and markets. You're going to have a much more direct transmission in China than you are in Sierra Leone, for example. Urban markets will be more immediately affected than rural markets. But when you get to rural markets, it's not that farmers are going to be better off and urban consumers are worse off, because most of the poor people are farmers and most of the poorest are net consumers. And so it gets to be much more dicey and some really interesting analysis under that level. So let's move to that level. Um, I want to talk about biofuels in Africa. The World Bank actually put out a really interesting book, a very informative book on biofuels in Africa, Don Mitchell, well worth taking a look at. And um, there's a whole range of rationale, but there's half a dozen that are really in, important. You know, why is Africa going down this road? You know, one is they are trying to in, create employment and income opportunities in the rural sector. They are trying to diversify their cropping systems, maybe smooth income over the cycle when you have a lot of spikes and drops in staple crops, um, and maybe create supply chain spillovers from these biofuels to the staple crops. But they could also really create an export industry. They see the United States having a big mandate, EU having a big mandate. Can they supply into that mandated uh, biofuel um, need that's going to be out there. And equally important, these countries tend to be really energy poor. You know, they have huge import um, costs on energy and very rapid demand. Many African countries, the transportation fuel demand is rising by 5% or more. And if you're a country that's landlocked, um, Zambia might be one of them, um, the CIF price, the import price for energy is extremely high. Um, so what they're really trying to do is reduce energy poverty as well. So there's all these variables that, that governments are really thinking of very seriously. Um, Nussbaumer um, put out an article this, this year in 2012 where he actually created an index of energy poverty. Um, and you can see the darker the color, getting closer to one, the more energy poor. Ethiopia is at the top of that list. But a number of countries I'll mention, Tanzania, Mozambique, Malawi, and so forth, are also extremely energy poor. Um, and when countries are thinking about doing that, it's not that they are thinking of going immediately to where we are on our biofuel sector. I mean, there is definitely a strategy of phasing this in over time. First is to develop biofuels feedstocks for export, to feed into these mandates I've just talked about, where there is duty-free access into the EU and partially into the US. The next step might be then to develop feedstocks both for export, but also for the domestic biofuel industry, maybe at the B5, E5 level. And finally, just to achieve energy security, you know, try to ramp this up, scale it up to get to E85, B85. Um, the feedstocks typically are jatropha, which is this oil crop, um, non-food crop. There, there tend to be non-food crops, actually. And um, the sugar, it both, this is both sub-Saharan Africa and India. Sugar, but they're using the molasses out of the sugar and then still having, out of the sugar cane and still having the sugar. So, those are the two major crops they're developing. There's also cassava, sweet sorghum, castor, oil palm, a number of others. Cassava, as I mentioned, is another big staple in Africa. So 
if a government wants to go down this road, you know, how should they actually think about evaluating the pros and cons of this? What should be under consideration? And actually, I'm going to draw from CWA's good work in this area, and he can add more to it in a minute when he comes up. But you know, the first is to look at the farm or the firm level. What are the production costs, the profitability, the international competitiveness of doing this, and the price volatility that corporations or farmers are really going to face? Um, really important is the macroeconomic features. You know, if, if governments are going to invest, do large public investments in this biofuels area, it comes an opportunity cost to having other sorts of public investments in food, crop, agriculture, in education, in healthcare, all sorts of things, right? And if they're going to give tax breaks for biofuels, for example, how are they going to sort out the fiscal balances of not having the tax revenue they need? Um, there's all sorts of employment and resource constraints they may have to use, worry about and what are the growth linkages going to be throughout the economy. And of course, if the first stage of exporting, what are, what's their macro policy on exchange rates and exports? You know, what, what's that look like? Uh, there's the household income and food security analysis that needs to be done. And then really critically, the resource and environment. What are the water and land requirements for this activity? Are, is it going to take place in wildlife corridors? What's the pollution from burning or the water pollution? So a lot of uh, different features, but these four, I think, are, are really key. And I'm going to just start, go through it briefly, but talk um, first about the farm level. Detrofa is this crop. This is what it looks like for those of you who haven't seen it. It's a drought-resistant shrub. Um, it's non-edible. The seeds are not edible. The leaves are toxic to humans and animals. It can be grown in all sorts of degraded land. So it's thought of as like rain. Again, 95% of agriculture is rain-fed in Africa. And so it's thought, this is a great crop. But in fact, growing Detrofa in these really marginal conditions gives you really marginal yields. Not enough yields, actually, to make, to scale up and get uh, enterprise out of this. And um, if you don't have extension for farmers, if you don't have the supply chains in place, it's going to be as unsuccessful as all of the other agricultural activities that we've seen in different areas. And so you're, it is true you're going to get better yields when you have irrigation, fertilizer, pesticides, you know, the intensive mix that you have in other places. So don't be fooled by this low input degraded land trophy. It's not going to actually get us there. And the more, uh, I think the most um, largest constraints, actually the labor cost. Um, these seeds actually um, ripen not simultaneously over a four or five month period and they have to be hand picked. And so these firms might be in this kind of dilemma. On the one hand, you know, they need workers out there hand picking all this stuff for four or five months, but it's not year round like a tea plantation. You're not hiring people year round just for these four or five months and can you really find that labor to do it and so forth. It's, it's quite challenging, actually. Um, the World Bank, in the World Bank report, um, gave, went through a whole list, and uh, this will be on the web, but a whole list of different ways of doing either ethanol from molasses or, or detrofa-based biodiesel. And essentially, the cost of production was about 20 cents to 50 cents a liter for the either molasses or the sugar-based ethanol but about two times that for the detrofa. And most of the detrofa costs are coming through the wages, through the labor costs. And what's interesting for me in this is that the World Bank had the sense to actually value labor at a non-zero rate in Africa, which is really, really important because there is a big opportunity cost of labor in Africa in certain areas over certain seasons and so forth. And it may just not fly to do this given the labor requirements. How it's organized also makes a difference, and it's organized in all sorts of different ways. Some countries are saying, I'm just going to lease a whole bunch of land to a company that comes in, say, from the UK, um, and then they can employ people on these estates. Or the other one is to say, I want processors who will buy the commodity from these what, outgrowers, and this would be an example of an outgrower operation. They can sell the seeds. It'll be processed in these uh, small, the processors will create these supply chains and we'll have much more small scale enterprise that's feeding into this. And the, you know, the income implications of this are going to be quite different depending on the organization of this value chain. And it really differs um, in uh, different countries. Um, but think about it for a second. If um, you're trying to attract foreign investment to get into the biofuel area and you're a you know, leader of a government and you're saying, um, what will it take to get you in here to build this to scale, 
to give us income, rural development, and energy security and food security. Well, a company will say, first of all, I need a whole bunch of land. Okay. And most of the land in Africa is state controlled, and it's up to the state to actually sort that out and give them that land. And that's why we're seeing a lot of these land grabs. It's one, one area of all these land sales and deals and so forth. But the companies will also say, um, to do this effectively, I need roads, I need ports. You know, these are big investments now that the government has to come up with some money to do this. Okay. And I want, you know, need policies. I want support prices for the crop. I don't want tax on the oil revenue, or especially on the export. And a lot of sub-Saharan African countries tax fossil fuels quite heavily and um, get a lot of their revenue from that. And so if they're not going to tax biofuels, um, they're going to be short in the fiscal balance quite a bit. Um, they also might want mandates to secure a certain share. And then we get into what we have in this country. You know, I, I don't know, we're in the billions of dollars of how much we've spent to support that here. So the land deals are really interesting, and there's a lot of variation in land in sub-Saharan Africa. For example, Senegal individuals have the right to own land. In Mozambique, the state owns all the land. And in Tanzania, um, individuals can own land, can own property, but not real property. <laughs> in other words, they can't own land either. So um, what's happening in Mozambique? Mozambique's an interesting country because you know, it only uses about 10% of its arable land. And um, by 2009, already, it was receiving all sorts of requests to buy up to 12 million hectares of land for biofuel production. We are doing work, uh, Whitney Smith is doing work with us in this area and um, is digging into what the laws say. In fact, Mozambique has the best set of laws on the record. This gets to Rodrigo's thesis of great laws on the books and not necessarily in practice. But, um, but Mozambique has an aggressive law that actually protects customary lands. It's supposed to expose communities to a discussion anytime there's sales or leases, but it's really been mixed. So getting at that land issue is something that's of, of importance to us in terms of the development in the future. What's happening on these land sales, um, this is in the size is in proportion to how many land sales and transactions have occurred. So 25 million hectares in Asia, about 31 million hectares in Africa. Um, it's not all China coming in to Africa, by the way. That's the, the, this is Asia, which would be Africa. And, I mean, uh, this would be China, India, and other um, Asian per, you know, deal makers. But we have the United States, you know, North America, Europe, trying to meet its own mandates and also come in to this sector, the buying land. Africa itself has a large share of land transactions and land sales. In fact, a lot of African elites are purchasing land. Probably a, a lot of speculation. A lot of this land is not already being farmed, so there's a lot more speculation than we see in the US market of holding land until it's more valuable, selling it. Uh, Soros has even discussed trading it on the uh, Chicago Stock Exchange. And so these, it's, a mixed bag, it's a real mixed bag of actors here. And um, when you actually look at the agricultural land that has been purchased, uh, C4 did a study of about um, 18 million hectares, about 330 farms, and 43% of that was going to biofuels. So the question is, uh, when people get the land, do they also get the water resources, and what's going to happen to water? This is a big unanswered question. Um, and at the micro level, there are... Um, really good examples of success. East Ethiopia is one, the most energy poor country. Um, and they started up this castor oil outgrower um, situation. This is a typical, for those of you who've been in the field, this is, you sit around a lot like this, you know, and talk and, you know. And um, really successful though, because this, this castor, uh, uh, castor oil is um, indigenous to Ethiopia. It grows well. Um, farmers are not only growing castor oil, they're growing it around their farms, so they're also growing their crops. They're benefiting a lot from the processors coming in and the supply chains that are developing on fertilizer, on transportation, on markets, and so forth. And they're selling it year round, and they've been, their food security and incomes have been going up really high. And it's not the large producers, larger, larger farmers are actually going into other crops, not necessarily castor oil. So, so they're, on the micro level, you can find great success stories. Um, Ethiopia has its own biofuels policy. Over 800,000 hectares are devoted to biofuels. Um, a, you can imagine a lot of this is probably taking land that could be used for food crops. But a lot of private projects, outgrower schemes, uh, state 
projects and supporting uh, supply chains. So a lot of activity even in one of the poorest countries in the world. So what are the implications for rural incomes and food security? We'll go back to those definitions I used before, but I have this picture of this woman because I think the gender implications of this are extremely important, and people are doing work on this, but 70% of the workers in agriculture um, in sub-Saharan Africa are women, and they are mostly responsible for food production for the home. And so how this all sorts out on a gender basis, I think, is also going to be very interesting. So let me take just five minutes before I end to um, just mention what's happening in India. And I want to mention this because the next symposium talk is going to be on India. And so you should at least have the biofuel footnote on this. Um, India actually also has a national policy on biofuels targeting 20% uh, of blending for ethanol and biodiesel by 2017. Also non-food crops, eutropha and, and sugar, molasses. But they have all these policies that I talked about, minimum purchasing prices, minimum support prices, minimizing taxes, and so forth, all those things that are going to have a cost to its macroeconomic situation over time. And what's interesting about India is these policies are made at the national level, but states do their own thing. And so the, the, the states are out there acting on their own, and how much of this gets followed, it's, it's a really kind of chaotic situation. I'm hoping Siwa may put some footnotes on that as we get into it. Um, the sugar has been really interesting. This is sugar production in India going from the 1960 to 2010. And in the green line is the sugar production. You can see it's gone up, but really lot, very volatile. And so they've always had a hard time meeting blended targets for molasses due to this incredible volatility. And their land ownership prevents any kind of vertical integration. Blenders can't invest in feedstock. Mills can't own land and so forth. It's all small scale producers. And so um, it's going to be challenging for India to get there. And most of their sugar, you can see here, is these are the uh, states that produce sugar. Um, Uttar Pradesh is about 50%, and then these other states are growing the rest. Almost all of it is 100% irrigated, except Bihar is much less. Um, so irrigation is being used a lot for sugar um, and not necessarily for other crops. When I was last in India, there was quite a big discussion of the sugar coming in and using all the water. And so this is another issue, I think, for India. They're also doing a jatropha and biodiesel. Um, say the UK company D1 is a big into India here and trying to do it at plantation scale. So there's large, small firms. Um, and supply chains, the ones I've talked about before, vary enormously by state. So whether these small farmers are benefiting or not depends completely on the state and the kinds of institutions, supply chains, and arrangements that are being made at the state. There's all sorts of degraded land, and they're thinking of putting Jatropha in there, but you know, is this really going to scale up? This is, looks like an impossible situation to me, but you may have a different opinion. So uh, I'm just going to conclude the overall talk, um, first by just mentioning on biofuel mandates again. You know, the biofuel mandates are the one that are, can, you know, really influencing the price levels and variability and have really big implications for trade. You know, we have this incredibly inefficient trade pattern going on in China with us now being so efficient in producing so much ethanol. We're shipping to Brazil, and Brazil is shipping to us for the advanced biofuels. That just seems crazy. I don't know how we're going to sort that out. But also, there's these export opportunities for sub-Saharan Africa, um, duty-free access to get to meet these mandates. And there's an important role for co-products and what that all looks like with biofuels. When we think about the key of what this symposium is all about, the rural development side, the key issues I think to worry about are this land acquisition, land grab issue. You know, what's happening with the states coming in versus smallholders. We had the last talk on smallholder agriculture and land in Africa. And this talk should really address that last talk, I think, in important ways. Uh, land values and speculation. Water resources are hardly ever talked about, and this is going to be, I think, a fairly big deal with biofuels. But the macroeconomic implications of what policies have to be put in place, who's going to benefit, and so forth, is um, going to become, I think, a huge issue as to whether they succeed or not. And then um, w w whether you see national versus state jurisdiction, all of this, usually any biofuels policy comes in there's five or six ministries involved, the Ministry of Trade, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Energy, the Ministry of Transportation, the, you know, and they all, 
who's going to get the power over that? How's that actually going to work when you get into policy um, advising and trying to pick the right administrator? You're going to want to stick with a finance minister for sure, but overall there's going to be a pretty tricky thing, I think. Um, and I think the areas for further study are going to be um, really looking at land institutions in Sub-Saharan Africa. As I said, we're trying to do that at FSE right now. But really trying to link the macro to the micro linkages on biofuels development is, to me, the key here. And then, of course, the food security implications. Are we going to have enough food in the future and access to that food given the high and unstable prices? What are the food gaps going to be and, and the role of women? So with that, I will turn it over to Siwa and, uh, and look forward to a discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roz. Uh, you're a hard act to follow, but I will um, try and just focus on a few of the points that, um, that you raised and, and to try and amplify some, maybe with some examples from some of the case study countries that you mentioned. Indeed, it is a very complex issue, and, and, and that linkage between the biofuels and prices that you mentioned is, is, is very relevant, and, uh, and, and especially the price of oil. I think that's really a critical driver um, uh, in, in a lot of sectors, not just in the fuel sector. Um, and definitely the, the fast growth that was um, seen in the U.S. expansion of corn ethanol um, in the 2005-06 period um, now, some would argue that certainly the run-up that you saw in the maize prices certainly had to do with the fact that U.S. corn ethanol was growing very quickly. Now, whether that growth in U.S. corn ethanol was entirely due to the tax credits or the mandates is another issue. If you have, uh, Babcock has a paper, I'd be happy to send it to you, that says, well, it was actually the fact, it wasn't so, I mean, if you took away those tax credits, the production would have dropped a little bit, but it was really the fact that in that period when the oil prices were high and the feedstock prices of maize were relatively low, there was an incredible return to your investment. You could pay back the cost of building an ethanol plant in less than a year. I mean, that was money that was too good to turn down. And those who got in early made a lot of money. And those who waited a little bit late, by the time the uh, corn prices started rising and the oil prices started coming down a little bit, they lost a lot of money. So it was really that boom. So certainly the boom in ethanol production caused the full, the, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the increase in maize prices, but it was more due just to the overall macroeconomic condition. But certainly that linkage between that energy prices and the relative prices of the feedstocks and what happens in that sector is very relevant indeed. Um, and oil prices have an effect across uh, many sectors, not just the transportation, uh, um, transportation sector. And so many people now believe that this sort of cycle where we see high oil prices, depressing demand, not only for uh, fuel products, but it has a macroeconomic effect across the economy. And then that brings down demand eventually, and then that will then, it's, then you sort of go through another cycle where the price of oil is now lower because less people are using it, and so that's gonna encourage the price of biofuels, and then that will sort of, so we're gonna be locked into the cyclical uh, cycle because oil is so important to the economy and because its ups and downs will have an effect on so many sectors. So certainly, that linkage between prices and what happens is very important. Um, and certainly, the price rises can be negative for many, and it can be positive for, for a number, especially if the nature of those price rises tends to be gradual and sustained over time, because that allows people the opportunities to mobilize resources, be it uh, capital, uh, be it on-farm technologies, to be able to make use of those higher returns. Um, and, and that is, tends to be good for farmers. The fast, sharp, sudden price rises aren't as useful, and those are the ones that are really bad for consumers. So, so the nature of price rises matters, and who it affects, of course, matters a lot in terms of whether they're going to be the people who are the net consumers of, of, of what's going up in price versus those who are the net producers of it. So, uh, so not all price rises are equal, uh, but, but they do matter a lot. And certainly, um, in terms of the, the, the linkage, the asymmetric nature in terms of whether the, ag, ag, the energy market is going to be driving what happens in the agricultural market or vice versa is certainly there. I mean, the size of, of the energy market is much larger than what happens in agriculture. In the case of Brazil, though, what we're seeing now is that what's happening in terms of the high prices of sugar, and they have a very flexible system whereby if the prices of sugar are very high in the world market, they then scale back their ethanol production to produce more of that. And so at the moment, actually, they're, they're importing uh, ethanol from the US uh, in order to, and, and because their 
sugar sector is having some constraints that it can't expand fast enough to make sure that they can produce enough for everyone, they're actually going to continue probably importing for a little bit while. So in that sense, the food fuel relative prices have very much an effect on how that sector operates, which is different from how other sectors like India operates because they don't produce the ethanol directly from the sugar juice, but in the case of Brazil, they do. So that, that's a very relevant linkage. The linkages are complex, they're interesting, and they have feedbacks that will, that will lead to very interesting dynamics and continue to lead to very interesting and powerful dynamics in the future. And I think the issue of the multiple use of the biofuel feedstocks and whatever sub-products, uh, byproducts that are produced, I think is key. And uh, as I mentioned, this flexibility in terms of whether you decide to produce for one market versus another gives the producers themselves a bit of market certainty. They, can, they know that even if the, the price for one possible product goes down, they have this other market that they can sell to. And, and that helps sort of stabilize things within the sector. And they've been able to mobilize, bring to bear that continuous mobilization of technology and incredible R&D behind their sugar sector. I mean, that what they're able to achieve in yields is really due to the fact that they have a number of uh, R&D centers that are really concentrated on making the highest possible feedstock productivity, which is, which is the key to success in, in, this, in this kind of thing. And this is exactly where I think Jatropha, and I'll come back to, I have a whole slide on this, uh, where Jatropha falls down because its byproducts are not useful. So the crush that you normally get from any oilseed crop, be it soybean, be it groundnut, be it rapeseed, be it sunflower, that crush, that meal, is usually used for livestock. In this case, you cannot use it for livestock. Some people claim it could be used for other things, but really, as Roz mentioned, that, that, that's where the value is going to come when you're in the oilseed business. And, and the fact that that oil product itself can't be used as, a, as an oil crop for food uses, it has to be used. I mean, again, there's one, there are ideas about how you could use it in other cases, but certainly you're not going to get the same type of flexibility through that dual use and flexibility of your how you use your byproducts as you will with other things. So that's one among many uh, drawbacks for Jatropha. Um, and what's interesting, uh, just to touch briefly on the, on the African con uh, context, and I should actually point you there is a FAO did a, in 2010 did a very detailed, in fact, they did a detailed report on biofuels in three countries, um, Peru, Tanzania, and um, uh, Thailand. And I, would, uh, I can point you to them on the website if you, if you want. There's a company that what used to be called CCAB in Tanzania, and uh, they had to change their name. Their, the venture didn't go as, as well as it, they wanted it to in its first incarnation. They were a major import of ethanol to Sweden. And in the new incarnation of, of EcoEnergy, when I was listening to them in, in December, they've adopted a very interesting approach. What they're saying is that, OK, we know that energy markets are, 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 are volatile, but we know that in East Africa and in Tanzania, the demand for sugar is going to go up. Um, and so what we're going to focus on is producing as much sugar as we can. And with that molasses that's left over as a byproduct, if we can convert some of it to ethanol, that will be more revenue for us. But our, our approach is to try and get the sugar production going as best as we can and make money off of that market. And that doesn't actually seem like a bad approach. I think in, in the case, because they know there, there's a supply chain. I mean, they know the supply chain. They know that the market, market exists. They know how to convert the product. And, um, and they know that they're, they're going to be able to sell it. So that, that's the approach that they're taking, and maybe others will as well. And maybe there could be an analog in the oil crop sector where people can just focus on the productivity of producing the oil, and then the market uh, for that oil, be it either in food or be it in fuel, will be there in the future. So that, that could be an interesting approach to use. So as I mentioned, uh, Jatropha, um, even though it's hardy and it survives and in marginal conditions, its yields are indeed marginal. And as I just mentioned, it's non-food nature, while attractive to some people, uh, has, its, has its drawbacks. And really the main problem is that the yields are too low. Um, and they're, they're too low to be profitable because in a large scale enterprise, your, the lowering of your costs comes through high productivity of your feedstock. I mean, that's, that's the way it works. And right now, uh, if you were to grow Jatropha under rain-fed conditions, you may be able to get three tons a hectare. Most people are getting about 1.5. If you irrigate it and put fertilizer, it's, you know, you can get up to the five, six, seven, but that's not where they are in a lot of countries. And as the high labor cost partly comes from the fact that um, it flowers at different times. So you have to go through and, and, with, and through the field and, multi, uh, and, and, and harvest multiple times. And it's because it's an unimproved variety and there's 
that's really the, at the crux of the problem. It's really undergone no genetic improvement whatsoever. There's no agribusiness venture in the world that has been able to be successful. I mean, think of the California agribusiness sector that we have here, the, the orchard crops. You can't just take a wild variety and expect to make a success. It probably needs about 10 to 15 years of probably good R&D. And, and crops like jojoba is, is a good example where you, if you really focus on the genetic and the varietal improvement, um, you can do something with it in the future. Right now, they're really playing around with the agronomic practices. Can we make it grow better? But really, uh, they need a better um, genetic base. I think there's a lot more genetic variety in South America. In fact, we have a colleague, a uh, collaborator, who's actually looking into the issue of R&D and what's needed for Diotropha in order to make it more productive in the future. So that's not to count it out entirely, but the variety that we have right now um, doesn't deliver the, 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 the types of um, yields that are needed. And again, uh, the, the, the lack of edibility of some of the byproducts is a, is a drawback, so that uh, that's already a value that you've lost. Um, and in some sense, it seems to me at least that we're transferring some risk onto farmers. And this, this is the case of Senegal, where, um, I, and I enjoy working in Senegal a lot, but, but from what I've understood in terms of how they went about their biofuels, industry was to give as many seedlings as they could to farmers and say, well, you know, try and grow them. Uh, oh, by the way, it'll take about three to four years before you get that first yield. But once you've grown it, then we can see what we can, we can do with it. So right now, there is no value, to, there is no processing facilities, there's no government mandate that says we are going to guarantee you we're going to buy this volume of Detrofa oil at this price. So at least India has that. They have a minimum purchase price. Uh, it's too low right now to make it profitable, but at least they have it and they have the experience in how to convert it. But in the case of, of Senegal, they haven't figured that out yet. And that, that to me seems that you're transferring a lot of risk onto small farmers without offering them really something, a good feedstock and, 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 a, and, a, and a value chain that can give them some demand that they can count on in the future for their product. So it seems to me at least that example uh, shows, uh, well, it's, it's basically a lack of design in, in that case. Um, and I think in terms of, and, and Ross touched on this, in terms of the policy objectives, and there are many policy objectives uh, that underlie biofuels programs, both in OECD and non-OECD countries. And for some, uh, the policy is, you know, let's just produce Let's produce biofuels. We're going to use it in a transportation center. We know we have a feedstock that delivers. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to reduce the carbon intensity, but that's not the real objective of the program. Let's just produce the biofuels, and, and we know how to use it. Uh, and the policy is geared towards, uh, and it favors certain feedstocks that, 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 that are productive in, in the US. Uh, for some, the carbon objectives are more uh, explicit, um, uh, which is the case in a lot of the EU, where they're actually concerned about the carbon intensity in the fuel pool of the state of California, the LCFS, the Low Carbon Fuel Standard, which is currently under litigation, is another example where they've looked specifically in terms of, let's look at all the fuels that we have and try and lower the carbon intensity, and let's choose those fuels that, that, that perform the best in, in that measure. And that, that, that determination in terms of which fuels you're going to choose becomes complicated when you not only take into, into account the life cycle uh, implications of the greenhouse gas emissions, but also the other indirect effects. And that's been an area of very intensive uh, research in recent years. And for some, um, it's really the, the avoidance of those fossil fuel imports. And as Roz mentioned, that's, that's, that is a legitimate concern for some who are importing a lot of their fossil fuel at, at a great expense in terms of what their national budget can, can, can afford. Um, and for some, it's the uh, wanting to avoid not so much that we're going to use less fuel, but we don't want to use as much fuel. Either we don't want to depend uh, as much of it from people that we don't like, or we just want to try and produce as much from our own resources, um, even if the total amount of consumption and greenhouse gas emissions is the same. And you know, in some cases, that could be a, a, a realistic objective or at least a, a legitimate objective. But the fact is that all of these are different. And the policy that achieves one isn't necessarily going to achieve the others. Um, or any one of the others at all. So, and that's where governments really need to sit down and figure out what is their biofuels policy for, what can it achieve. If it's really for the carbon uh, avoidance, then that will determine in terms of which feedstocks and, and your production processes. Um, but, um, and, and you may have to, but if, and you have to consider not only the transportation sector, but also all sectors. And that's where it becomes uh, complicated. And there's actually a study 
ongoing at UC Davis Institute for Transportation Studies is trying to look at what will happen if you try and scale up the California policy to become the US policy, if not entirely to replace it, but at least to complement it. How much, then, how much better than would the US be in terms of its greenhouse gas emissions, in terms of how much maize ethanol it would use, in terms of how much oil it would import from other places? And, and that's a very interesting study. It's, it's still yet to come out in its final form, but I think it'll have some very interesting evaluation of trade-offs um, that, that I think you should all stay, stay tuned for. So let me just close because um, I know we're at, um, at the end of the, uh, of the time when we need to go to questions. But I think in terms of when, where we see biofuel operations working best is when we can have a feedstock of very high productivity because, again, that will lower the cost and it'll probably also um, entail less competition with other land uses if you have very high producing feedstock. Um, and when you have um, the, this dual uses, when you can use your, when your feedstock as well as the byproducts that come from it can have multiple uses besides just in, in the fuel sector. And when there are possibilities for vertical integration. So uh, in countries like, as Raz just mentioned, in India where they don't want that, where, you, where that vertical integration is not possible, then already you're, 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 you may be missing some economies that, that could be gained. Uh, and, and, uh, and, you, and you have to have the, the value chain and people all, all along the value chain have to be making money in that sense, have to be profitable. Um, and so when countries do not meet these conditions and, there's enough, and obviously Senegal is not meeting a lot of these conditions, um, then you should really reconsider what your priorities are and assess the trade-offs. Um, if it's really the blending target that you're after, maybe importing is what you need to do. And certainly India has imported ethanol before. Uh, Brazil right now is importing ethanol. Um, again, if, if, if you're, depending on what your target is, is it to produce it ourselves? Is it to avoid uh, the imports of other fuels? Um, or is it simply to support the sector? But again, those are priorities that need to be assessed realistically in terms of what they entail uh, in terms for trade-offs without the objectives. And I think um, the, the energy problems, and I think Roz's map pointed to that, is, is, is comprehensive. It goes just beyond the transportation fuels, even though we know that is going to be a very fast-growing uh, uh, part of the transportation energy demand pie. Um, but maybe for some countries, there, there could be other strategies to address that issue of energy that, 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 could, that, that could serve better, that could be serve the needs of the country better than through the current uh, plans for biofuels. And, and that could also address that rural urban, those rural and urban needs. Um, the, certainly getting people off of the heavy dependence upon biomass um, could be one way. And there, and, there, and there are biofuel products, there are ethanol gels that have been proposed that could get people at least away from using biomass, clearing forest, inhaling the smoke that comes from burning dung and wood inside the house. And, and that's a legitimate target. Um, but again, that's not a transportation fuel, but that, that's, again, an energy need that could be, that could be met. Um, but if it's agribusiness that we're, if we're trying to get these, and a lot of countries are thinking, as Raz mentioned, of these investments as a way of getting investment into the, into the sector. And there could very well be um, opportunities outside of just for biofuels where, where, where you can uh, crowd in investments, where you can get spillovers between what's happening at the operation and what happens, what technologies are able to then to be adopted by the outgrowers, that could be beneficial. Um, maybe the, the sugar, you know, just produce the, the, the crop that we know has a market value, and if the byproducts can produce ethanol or biodiesel, so be it. But let's, let's, if, if there are good opportunities for agribusiness, um, I think there's a, there's a case for taking it. But being cognizant, of course, of all the uh, issues of implementation of the land issues, I know Klaus Deininger at the World Bank is coming up, is think, is, has been working very hard on trying to come up with a framework for evaluating risks to land tenure and, uh, and land security in the context of both operations within the World Bank as well as in other ventures. And I think that's, that's a very good thing, and it needs to be done systematically and carefully. Um, and so I think that's all I'll see for right now. Thank you. As you are thinking about your questions, let me get the panel started uh, with one of my own. And that is, Siva, you live in Washington. Mm -hmm. Raj, you've been watching Washington, D.C. Do you see, uh, you see anything in the, the new farm bill 
new energy bills that are likely to change biofuels in the United States in a, in a fundamental way? Ross? Well, I think if I was to make, uh, make my bet, I don't think the mandates are going to come off. And um, if I was going to make my bet, it would be that the E15 is going to go higher up in the future. Um, as, as was already mentioned, I think the big policy development that makes that that uh, that ha happened in 2010 um, in terms of the uh, getting rid of the tax credit. Actually, I happened to be at on the Hill for a discussion on that, and it was a very interesting coalition of people who were arguing against the tax credit. You had uh, Tea Party Republicans who were against the the, the the fact that you're paying people to do what they're already mandated to do. The livestock producers were there. The NGOs were there, people concerned about the uh, environmental sustainability. So it was a very interesting coalition of people that got that off the table. The food price issue, though, will continue to come up. Um, um, there has been proposals to make the mandates more flexible, perhaps. Well, one aspect of flexibility that, that could be produced, I'm not sure exactly how, how seriously it's being discussed, is whether or not you can increase the flexibility that um, obligated parties have for rolling over their credits from one year to another. So as it exists right now, you can purchase, um, the, the mandates are enforced by the, the number of, perm, of, of renewable identification numbers, as they call them, that are given to EPA. And that can represent the fuel that you've actually blended or the fuel that somebody else blended, but they sold you that RIN uh, because they, they happened to blend more than they were obligated to. So there's a tradeability in that. Some have, have suggested perhaps allowing that to go just beyond, to, to extend that so people can bank those for longer, so that if there is a high increase in prices, people have the flexibility um, to, to, in terms of what they act, will actually blend, and that, that will help the, the market outlook. Thank you. Questions? Joanne? Hi. Um, thanks to you both for a great pair of talks. I wanted to pick up on Siwa's slide about policy motivations. Um, in the past, environmental concerns have been a big driver of biofuel policy in the United States and elsewhere, and, and they still, to some extent, are. I mean, Roz mentioned the um, imports of sugar ethanol into the United States because of the extra greenhouse gas savings. So I'm curious how you think environmental, the environmental impetus will stack up against other motivations for producing biofuels, economic motivations, maybe in the future, and what that means for the kinds of crops that are likely to get turned into biofuels in the future. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, yeah, I'll just maybe start and, and then you. Um, yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's going to um, differ a bit between the United States and Europe. And, and Eric, you might want to say something as well on this because you've just come from Europe and some of these debates in, in the fall. I think um, the Europeans, um, the reports that are coming out, they're much more worried about um, the real environmental impacts of the oils that they're putting into their blending. I mean, the rapeseed is one thing domestically, but anything that's coming from overseas, particularly your crop, <laughs> palm oil, <laughs> which is not allowed, obviously, really in, in much of their blending because of the environmental regulations, um, is, is going to be a serious consideration. And, um, and in some of the conversations that's been going on, they're much more aggressively looking towards non you know, natural gas types of options and other other types of transportation fuel than just biofuels. I think it'll be different than what we're seeing in in the U.S. And um, I, I'm curious to see what Siwa thinks in terms of how we're going to sort out the importing from Brazil versus the um, exporting to Brazil at the same time. How we'll sort that out? That just doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. In terms of the the the, the the um, environmental uh, objectives. Right now, it's difficult to talk about climate in the current political environment. At least it hasn't come up. Uh, so whether or not you're going to get a really strong push for reducing carbon intensity of, of all fuels at the federal level uh, remains to be seen, perhaps at the state level. As I mentioned, the LCFS in California is currently under litigation. But you could have, there's, there's so, there are some regional movements. So the Midwestern Governors Association uh, had also started a study, I know the Northeastern, NESCALM, I think is the acronym, they were looking at possibly um, sort of a low carbon type of fuel standard. So you might, and, the, and of course in the Northeast, transport, actually home heating is a main use of, uh, domestic use of uh, energy as opposed to transportation fuels. So you may get more success within the U.S. 
through these regional initiatives that are fueled you know, by, by, by local concerns about um, uh, rather than getting something to the federal level. Uh, because right now, at least, the discussion seems to be very difficult. And yeah, I mean, it, it, is, it is weird that mm -hmm. we're, now we're now exporting to, 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 to Brazil. And if, at least for the foreseeable future, that will be the case just because um, they, and it's the fact that they have a very much higher level of penetration of flex fuel vehicles. And if that were to change in the US, that would change the picture as well. The fact that Brazilians, when the oil prices go up, they switch to ethanol immediately. So their demand for ethanol goes up much more quickly in the Brazil than it does in the US because they have that flexibility. And, and that's why they, they, need, they need the ethanol that comes from the US right now. But um, I think an energy policy that looks both at the supply as well as the demand side and how to get these technologies that maybe could use natural gas. Again, so if we, if we are able to get that flexibility and when I go to India, most of the taxis are natural gas. Uh, and and, uh, and, there, are, and there's, there, there is some progress in public transportation in the U.S., but that could, be, that could change. Yeah, that's why I suggested that we might go up from E15, just that integration, you know, taking care of it. But Eric, on the European side, do you want to say anything about the, the environmental debate there? No? Okay, <laughs> nothing to add. Okay. <laughs> Peter Timmer? Uh, thanks. Uh, wonderful, wonderful talks. A lot going on there. Um, I was struck by one thing in particular. You showed the lock-in between maize prices and petroleum prices after 2006, and they really track. At the same time, natural gas has completely diverged. And I guess you just mentioned natural gas as an alternative. Is natural gas actually the second-generation biofuel? Uh, does that then, if if we could use natural gas for a lot more of our uh, transportation fleet, would that take some of the heat off of uh, the food side uh, of this? Yeah, I mean, I think it would definitely take, take heat off the food side if that's the way it goes. It's, it's going to be interesting to see um, where, the po you know, where the political debate around this goes. I mean, we're, we're full steam ahead on natural gas. I just had a colleague out here from Montana. He said he goes into parts of Montana. As far as you can see, it's just fracking everywhere across the landscape. You know, it's just an unbelievable. And we're, we're full steam ahead on that. I mean, I think that natural gas prices are going to stay down until we mobilize this in, in, in this way that you're talking about, you know, sort of full-on substitution. But whether or not um, the other side of the lobby allows that to happen, it's going to be kind of interesting to see w w how, how that gets mandated. David, you, were, you and I were talking about that. Do you want to add anything on where you see that happening? I would say that one of the things um, is the infrastructure. So when you're dealing with plug-in electrics vehicles and probably natural gas, the way we know that we know the technology for making natural vehicles work on natural gas. I mean, we saw in World War II people in Europe were using natural gas to run their vehicles. So, so it's been around. The question is whether you will have enough filling stations, I suppose, around a big a country as big as the U.S. to make it worth for the consumer to adopt that technology. And, and, and they're facing the same thing with the plug-in electric um, uh, vehicles. But I think that can be overcome. But it will, be, it will require some investment. It requires some commitment from the federal level. But provided once that's done, it only needs to be done once, I think. Um, in Brazil, and the way that they got, um, you know, they, they said every high octane pump has to be replaced by an ethanol. I mean, that's how they got ethanol into the gas station. They, they said that. It's not as easy to do that in the U.S., though. But, uh, but there's still going to be a 15-year hi hiatus in here where a yeah. lot of the biofuel has to play out. There was a question there. Could you identify yourself as you, as you begin, please? Thank you. My name is Drew. I'm a chemical engineering PhD student. My question is on one of the efforts on international governance uh, related to biofuel development, specifically the clean development mechanism and carbon credits. My question is that, um, well, given that my, my knowledge is a few years dated, but you can clarify, that one of the things you have to prove in order to receive carbon credits is additionality over a business as usual baseline, and that if there's a mandate imposed, then a potential biofuel producer may not be able to gain access to carbon credits because of the mandate. And also, um, well, so that question is more geared toward Roz, and as well to see what just any progress to date 
on the clean development mechanism reaching more of sub-Saharan Africa, mm -hmm. as much of the initial rollout was to um, just a few countries that received a bulk of those carbon credits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, renewable f fuel standard, um, it does set a baseline relative to 2005 in response to, you know, to this international discussion. And, um, and so the mandate, what they're trying to do is get the advanced biofuels in, in you know, quickly to um, get the 50% reduction relative to the baseline, which would be the conventional gasoline use. Um, that's the Brazilian sugar coming in, actually. Um, but, um, but I'm not sure, you're, are you saying if mandates are in place at all, no one can get the credit, or just relative to the amount that they're using? Pardon me. In the example that I encountered, um, there was a mandate by the Ugandan government yeah. where uh, within a sub-Saharan sub -Saharan African nation, there was a mandate for certain uh, biofuel blending within that country and that that may be a limit to um, the availability of Ugandan biofuel producers to receive carbon credits through the approval of the carbon credits. Oh, yeah. That would, and it really depends probably very much on, on what, the, what the source, what they're blending and so forth. Yeah, I think that is a a barrier that has to be discussed in those countries, yeah. yeah. Isn't it also the but, case, case well, though, that if we have to wait for the clean mechanism, uh, clean, the cleaner mechanism to work, we may be waiting a long time? <laughs> it could be. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, certainly in the South Sudan African context, and I don't study this issue extensively, but my understanding of the issue is sometimes it's harder to get small projects uh, into that mechanism for a, a, a sort of as integrated into that mechanism as it is for big projects. So, and this may be, and I haven't done this study, but it'll be interesting to see whether or not you may have a better case for saying, look, we have transformed 10, you know, 1,000 1, villages over from using traditional biomass from, from firewood and from, and, from, and from clearing land to these clean ethanol gels versus we've converted this many vehicle users over from using uh, diesel to, 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 to biodiesel. So there may be, there may be a, I think there is a case for it, and it may be easier to do that on the home cooking front. But again, I haven't run those numbers. But, and I, but I think that's something that if people want to use renewable energy, bioenergy being one of them, uh, as a means for mobilizing investments from things like the CDM, uh, I think those, those comparisons, and, and, and I think that, should be, that assessment should be made systematically. Tom Hurdle? I've been thinking about Wally's admonition to uh, think about the audience out there who's going to be watching this in perpetuity, not just for the, the next hour. And so I have, in, that, uh, in light of that, I have a comment and a question. You're welcome to comment on the comment, too, if you want. But uh, just from the point of view of speaking to the future policymakers in Africa and South Asia, um, who often are prone to copy perhaps what the U.S. has done, I think this is a great an, an area to be very wary of copying what the U.S. has done. This idea of picking winners, saying we're going to get this much from corn ethanol, this much from soybean uh, biodiesel, it's a disaster. So uh, a broader based, if there is going to be a mandate, a broader based mandate that lets the technology evolve, the competitiveness dictate which direction they go, I think it would be far preferable. It also have much less of the kind of impact you indicated, Roz, in your diagram making demand very inelastic, for example, for the product that's particularly mandated, and um, spreading that across many products would have a much bit more beneficial effect. So I think that's just a heads up as they're making their policies in the next five or 10 years, um, more flexibility along those lines would be better. I think there's just a strong incentive to, to reward certain producer groups, and um, so it's hard to resist. Um, the question uh, for Roz and for Siwa as well, but um, the previous, one of the previous talks by David Lobel down here was on the climate side. Okay? You've been speaking to the demand side, the biofuel side, but the big development on the supply side, according to this lecture series in the future, will be climate change. How is climate change going to interact with biofuels in the future? Uh, can you draw anything out for the online audience who just watched that lecture? an hour ago. <laughs> Thanks for such an easy question. <laughs> um, you know, your comment, uh, your comment is really good. And in terms of the crops, what um, Sub-Saharan Africa, 
they're looking for what crops do they have already in effect that they're reasonably um, competitive in. You know, sugar sugar is one of them. That's why they're using sugar. And um, actually, particularly in Mozambique, the Brazilian influence on on Mozambique. That's an interesting interesting one that doesn't involve the U.S. But uh, the Stratrofa, you, your your comment was was so classic. Um, uh, when you just transfer the risk to small farmers, give them a low yielding perennial with no food or feed value. <laughs> you know, we don't want to go down that road. That's for sure. Now, on the the climate side, you know, th these are drought tolerant. You know. Um, hardy little little plants that one might say this is good for future climate change although as we've seen you know and discussed there really is um, very low yields if you're not applying a lot of irrigation and fertilizer and so forth and I don't know what the heat tolerance of Trotrofa is but I don't think this is a winner anyway right um, <clears throat> sugar um, David you'll have to remind me what sugar's temperature threshold is is it it's high yeah, so that's what I said. So sugar is not bad for, for this kind of crop. Um, you know, so, so sugar, sugar is probably the best bet, whether or not, you know, if we're not even developing climate strategies for our food crops, you know, um, it'll be interesting to see whether biof <laughs> the biofuels provides more impetus for this or, or less. But. In terms of... Um, um, Yes, having that flexibility, not picking winners. Uh, in fact, I think I heard your, 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 your colleague Wally Tyner sort of say that the way in which the tax credit was designed where you reward per volume already gives an advantage to corn ethanol a little bit. If you had, if you had given a tax per unit energy content, perhaps that would have incentivized. And I think you may need to do something like that in order to incentivize the cellulosics and the next generation technologies that need to come along to say, we're going to give you a tax credit per unit of energy that you deliver um, uh, to the transportation fuel pool. Um, but yeah, again, flexibility and having, I absolutely agree with that. Um, uh, in terms of how does climate change figure in, at least from, and I haven't seen, I haven't been following what's happening in the fifth assessment, but at least in the fourth IPCC assessment, most of the climate models seem to agree that in order to reach a, a degree of, climate, of carbon stabilization in the atmosphere, you need, bioenergy has to be somewhere in the mix. So by, I think most of the climate models, I mean, most of the integrated assessment models that were used tended to agree that you need to have bioenergy as part of your mix. So if you're going to think about how do we produce that biomass in, in order to create the, 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 the feedstock in order to produce that bioenergy, should we be doing it in the temperate countries where, or should we be focusing on the places where those yields might be higher? And you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, we know that between Angola Congo and Mozambique, maybe Tanzania, that southern African corridor, I mean, you have an incredible amount of, 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 bio, of biomass potential. Um, the question is how to incentivize it, how to motiv mo motivate it. We know that there's infrastructure issues that need to be overcome. And so the question is really how best do we introduce um, by, by renewable energy uh, for, from, from bioenergy into the energy fuel mix because we know that we're going to need it. Uh, in order to, and we're already committed to two degrees of climate change, but if we want, you know, I think, and and, and that's even, we, um, but I think even if we wanted to keep it from going to the extreme, we're going to still need um, more of, of, of bioenergy. So I think the question really is, how do we best produce it? Should we be producing it in the um, temperate countries, or should we be, be trying to incentivize the production of biomass from from tropical regions, being cognizant, of course, always of the danger of land use change. Because I was going to say, with the yes. per volume, the palm oil is, is looking pretty good on a per volume basis, but it yeah. involves a lot of land use change. Yeah. yeah. David, your your name has been used several times. This is your. I was just hoping you would call on me, Wally. Uh, <laughs> David Lobel from FSE. Um, a lot of really interesting and complicated issues you guys raise. Um, I was going to try a simple question, which is, it seems to me that one of the the key aspects of these mandates were not only the, the size of them, but how relatively unanticipated and, and quick they were. And that's related to the drawdown in stocks, it seems, um, which is obviously a big part of the price volatility, at least as I understand it. So the question, I mean, it, if I have that right, the question is it seems like there's lots of incentives and lots of catch up now to build up stocks. And I'm wondering if the nature of stocks also changes as the nature of demand changes, if, if we're going to continue to just focus on stocks in the primary grains, or if you're seeing 
in different countries also um, building up stocks of the ethanol or the biodiesel. And, and I have no idea how the economics of one or the other work out. Um, if it, you know, if the shelf life or the cost of, of storing ethanol is so much better. Um, so what are, we, what are we seeing on the storage response in general, um, both on the, on the crop side but also on the, on the ethanol side? Yeah, on the, on the crop side, um, you know, the, the reason why so many people are also looking at the, the corn stocks is that we have played such an incredibly large role in the global markets on this. You know, and in the past, prior to the biofuels, we've been able to buffer a lot of um, price, international price shocks actually with our own storage. And it's been, it's been a lot higher, and now we're not doing that anymore. We're not the buffer anymore, and we're just allowing the market to be quite volatile. Um, in fact, the recent stock report says, um, you know, it's predicted as lower than usual, but it did, has said that there are probably a number of people, uh, groups, holding stocks that they don't actually want to report or release yet until the prices go even further higher. <laughs> so this is the speculation, sort of the, um, the hedging that goes around this, this whole thing. And so uh, there, is, there is activity there, and it's not always... Um, very accurately accounted for. You know, the G20 was trying to have an activity where they could um, actually stabilize prices by um, revealing all information. Let's let's get all the information on the table of where the stocks are, where, you know, where the stocks and flows actually were, how much we have, and so forth. And of course, there are big groups like um, Cargill that makes money off of the margin. You know, they don't want to have everything so stable. And I mean, it's not that they want it unstable, but they're not going to report everything. I mean, that's part of where they make their business too. So there is, there are a lot of stocks held. Now, I don't know about the biodiesel. Do they? There's not much storage in that, is there? I don't know, actually. I mean, I would imagine that its, its market value would be would be would be would probably be better. You'd probably be better selling it to the market than holding it. But again, I don't know. And there may there could be some issues, at least with ethanol, in terms of trying to keep it. You know, it's agroscopic; it absorbs water. In terms of, uh, I don't know how difficult that is technically. It may be easier just to keep store ethanol in the feedstock and then convert it when you need it versus actually storing the product itself. Uh, and maybe this is where the, having those permits where you can trade um, your obligation to blend over time more flexibly, that might also prove, that might be also a way of being able to um, do arbitrage over time and be able to judge when, uh, have more flexibility in terms of when you produce your product and, 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 uh, and bring it to market. Wally, what do you think about the trading, or the stocks? Uh, I don't know the technical details of, of, uh, of, of the ethanol uh, storage. Um, but on the when side. I look at prices out there, I think the world thinks that we're going to have a lot more corn uh, next year uh, at, at the moment. And, and I wouldn't be surprised the supply response solves some of this, uh, this problem unless there are huge weather difficulties in the, U in the U.S. But if I knew the answer to that question, I'd be making a lot of money. Uh, but let me turn to my moderator role and, and come to, to this side with a question. Yes. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Sally Benson, uh, Energy Resources Engineering. Um, so you talked a lot about price volatility, and you make a compelling case about all the linkages between the corn and the other grains and so forth. And, you know, clearly when this price volatility was occurring, you know, we heard a lot about people suffering and, you know, riots and so forth. But what I haven't heard and is, you know, have people quantified the impacts of food volatility on mal malnutrition, you know, sort of global mal malnutrition statistics and, and child mortality? I mean, it seems to me, at least from, you know, the the information I get, it's sort of a lot of anecdotes. It'd be really, you know, are people studying what are really the impacts of this food volatility, um, food price volatility uh, on, on, you know, human health and well-being? And <laughs> Yeah, it's a really, really good question. And um, it is more, I would say it's more anecdotal. I mean, there was numbers that have come out that, and um, when you look at a lot of the malnutrition numbers, you know, typically it's based on um, average incomes in countries and, and then what it costs to buy food based on that average income. And so you're not only having an average income as opposed to breaking it down by, say, the income deciles. 
um, but you're also taking a food basket and not considering home consumption. You know, there's all these really tricky issues associated with it. I think the strongest, um, uh, both sort of theoretical and um, and validated in the field, is that um, that consumers in that lowest decile are the ones that are really hurt most by these kind of shocks. Um, 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 because they are net consumers, they are making up that difference. And um, but I haven't heard like one statistic. You know, the anecdotes are obviously that they're eating less meals, and they're already at the lower end of the staple consumption. So they're not trading out, you know, back into that. But we did um, quite a bit of work actually taking these LSMS data that are from the World Bank. Um, Karen Wong and others in our group just dissected this. Um, you know, painstakingly, and in that lower, the lower decile, the net consumer decile, um, they still actually spend, and this is in line with Esther DeFlo stuff, they still spend money on, on non-food items, and they also spend money on non-staple items. So large expenditures, for example, on meat and on sugar, and those tended to go out and the staples came in. So, you know, you're seeing some adjustment there. Um, but, but I can't give you, a, you know, a number of how many people actually died or, or the correlation of how many uh, disease cases went up or whatever. Do you have yeah. better data on that? Actually, I can send you a study. There's, um, and it takes a while for sometimes uh, this, the data to, to, to come out for you to be able to analyze it properly. I think the papers that have been coming out have been looking at the 2007, 2008 uh, food price uh, crisis. The World Bank has a, wor a, working, paper, pol a working policy paper um, that shows um, the effects of of, of the food price rises across different countries. They show that there was definitely more volatility. There was more on the international market than they saw, than they saw and they just took a subsample of countries. But in general, there was more volatility on international markets than there were on some local markets. And it's the domestic prices and how they change that really affects people. And, it's, and it, it, it will vary because the, the degree of price transmission can be either very high or very low, depending on some of the policies that were talked about. Um, whether or not, um, with, even within the country, um, the, the, the degree to which um, the, the price transmission between within the whether it's well integrated within the country will also matter greatly. But I, I will send you that they did estimate though that there was an increase at the um, both at the, at the at the poverty line as well as at the extreme level of poverty in, in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And they were using both um, data similar to what Roz just described, the LSMS data, as well as some modeling techniques because there, they, there are some possibly positive wage effects as well. But again, depending on what country you're talking about, those may not offset completely the food price and the income effects on household budgets. But, but I'll be happy to send them to you if you give me your contact after that. I think it probably needs to be said just how bad the the hunger data are, yeah. uh, and, and, and in that sense, the infant mortality data are as well. They're rough numbers to begin with. What we often see is interpolations, uh, and therefore, it's hard to get very precise about short-term movements. Other questions, Eric. Now that so much investment has been made in that biofuel sector, what would be the global economic consequence if, if the mandate in some region of the world would be decreased dramatically, which may well happen in the EU, not that they're very much motivated by the potential climate benefit you know, in terms of greenhouse gas emission, and now that this is being questioned. So, so I guess I would be trapped somehow in that system now that we've invested so much in that whole chain. Yeah, well, typically, when you have so much investment, um, it's it's not going to disappear <laughs> entirely. And I, I think that's really true. You know, the whole process of structural transformation that we talked about earlier in this series, a lot of that process by which you have all these investments going into agriculture and you have a lot of fixed costs in, invested, over time, you get these subsidies built up, not because agriculture represents a lot of uh, employment or income, you know, it's 2% of our employment, 2% of our income, but there's been so much sunk cost and so much now political um, strength behind that sector. I, I think there will be the same, certainly, for that within the United States. That's why I don't think the mandates are going to totally disappear, although the, the, the mandates may flex around. Um, the EU, the, that's a pretty strong agricultural lobby there, too. I would be a little bit surprised if they, I think it's going to be a long fight, but I would be a little bit surprised if they 
um, ditch their mandates on rapeseed because a lot of um, there has been a lot of expansion of rapeseed in um, in the European Union over this period of time too. So I think you have a pretty strong lobby behind this. I might be wrong, but I would be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think definitely, I mean, the volume, even if the EU is to drop, I mean, the volume of ethanol production is so much larger, and it's, it's the U.S. And, the Bra and Brazil that are that are driving that, and because Brazil has so many flex fuel vehicles that aren't going to go away, um, that's, uh, yeah. yeah. Don Kennedy? Uh, I was wondering what our unseen auditors in Asia and uh, Africa might be thinking about our domestic mandates here in the U.S. You sort of indicated, Ross, that 90 per, that the the uh, the uh, uh, 15 percent one might be a might might be doable. What about that substantially larger mystery mandate that has to do with using uh, cellulosic inputs and set of technologies that aren't yet quite available at utility scale. You gonna make it or are we gonna be embarrassed about it? <laughs> well, um, if, you, if you include um, highly efficient you know, sugar ethanol, like what you're seeing in Brazil in, in that advanced biofuels, um, that's gonna set up for, for a lot of you know, potentially Brazilian export of this if they, if they can do it. You know, they've had a lot of problems with their own sugar production and not having enough sugar production to, to meet their needs. Um, and it would take a long time, I think, for the African plants and the um, Indian plants to be that efficient. I mean, most of them are actually not using sugar cane, they're using molasses from sugar. It's much lower yielding and so forth, so that's not gonna meet the target. Um, I think that that our viewers um, in Asia and Africa uh, like like our mandates in the sense that there is opportunities for exports to these countries, but it, they're not necessarily the ones. I mean, there's um, a lot of UK investments, for example, in these lands that then are filling these mandates. You know, there, it's not necessarily all the income going to the African countries themselves, depending on how it's all um, how the value chain is working out. So, um, although there are potential um, rural growth opportunities to to fill our mandates. I'm I'm not sure they're going to benefit fully from it. What, what's your view on the field? Well, in terms of I, I don't follow the developments in cellulosic technology. I know that there's incredible investment by uh, on the technological level to make the feedstocks uh, uh, productive, like miscanthus. I know EBI, the BP Shell initiative that Berkeley and Lawrence uh, Livermore, uh, Lawrence Berkeley and um, and Illinois have. Um, they're focusing a lot on the technologies for growing higher productivity miscanthus and how to convert it better. The, the costs will always be an issue. Um, short of imposing probably politically unacceptable taxes on fossil fuels to make those costs uh, competitive, uh, I mean, I would imagine EPA is just going to continue issuing waivers uh, on the cellulosic part. Unless you have importation of proven, uh, of, of, of other biofuels, of first generation biofuels that have proven uh, lower carbon content like the Brazilian ethanol. Is it likely that they will raise the corn uh, uh, <laughs> limit to, to substitute for the cellulosic that's not there? What do you, what do you think about that? What are you hearing about I that? I think that's the, the <laughs> way out of the counter trade uh, uh, with 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 Brazil on sugar on, on sugar is, is what I think. But question? I can see in the back. Yes. Hi, I'm Lloyd Day. I'm a uh, former USDA official and a former technology co um, company lobbyist, and perhaps most importantly, a former student at Stanford during the reign of Don Kennedy. Uh. <laughs> <Rain>. <laughs> <laughs> A, a benevolent ring. Uh, yeah. um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, well, first compliment you on, you know, covering a vast array of issues in a very uh, succinct and uh, accessible way. So thank you very much for that. But um, I wanted to see if you could, I could add another issue into the mix, which would be technology. And in particular, biotechnology. Uh, biotechnology has increased the yields of corn and soybeans and has great potential in wheat and rice and other crops. Yet it is under attack by uh, many different groups. There's a Europeanization 
of California uh, in regard to biotechnology right now with the uh, proposition that's going to be on the ballot, not to mention the Just Label It movement in Washington, D.C. And I, I wanted to get your thoughts on the potential of biotechnology, both for biofuels as well as for its ability to withstand the political pressure that's occurring uh, globally. Hmm. That's a really good question. I mean, um, I know Chris Somerville up at Berkeley has been really pushing the, the use of the biotechnology for the um, cellulosic components of the crops and other that would be used, you know, and, and really advancing. So getting to your cellulosic faster and more efficiently and so forth in ways that you could break down that, that cellulosic wall, I guess, more effectively without as much energy and so forth. But um, you know, my personal my my personal view on that is I think that biotechnology is going to play a, a large role in meeting these demands. Now that we have this um, the food feed and fuel demand, and and they're slightly different kind of commodities that are going to be needed. I think that it's it's going to come come in big time. I I don't think in the U.S. California may be different, but I think in the U.S. I don't I would be really surprised if. Um, if we didn't still go ahead with the with the with the biotechnology, um, and is that good or bad? I mean, I'm more neutral on it. I'm sort of in the middle middle on that because um, you know the kinds of land and water resources and everything that I was talking about being needed to actually meet these goals are so astronomical. Um, being able to do it without having phenomenal productivity growth, like see what I was talking about, is just not going to happen. I mean, that well, yeah, it, it's just not. Something's it's, something's got to break here. It's it's not going to everything can't steam forward indefinitely without getting much higher productivity growth into the mix. So I, I think it is going to go forward. But I'd be curious to see what you think. Yeah, well, I mean, definitely biotech. I mean, you need as we just mentioned for Drotrofa, you need a lot of genetic. I mean, varietal improvement. I mean, some of it can will come through traditional breeding techniques. Some of them may come through uh, other techniques. Um, but I think yeah, if if there's a dis, if there's a demonstrable if, um, benefit to biotechnology gains. I think that's where people will buy into it. If, if you can demonstrate that you, you will be able to get more usable byproducts that have multiple uses for food, fuel, and others. Um, so maybe it, it, it will depend on the technology, how it's introduced, how it's sold. I, I, there's people who work much more in biotechnology than I do. In fact, as part of our biofuel study, we have uh, Carl Prey actually looking deeply into what types of biotechnologies will be are, are going on right now and have the promise for making biofuel sectors really take off. And it could be the case that some of these countries that are trying to do biofuels right now from first generation technologies might be better advised to wait until there's something better down the line. And some of those could come through technological improvements, I think. We have time for one more question. Yes. I'm Eve from the Environmental Earth System Science. I want to ask about the trade-off between food and biofuel in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, does the major drive for biofuel production come from foreign investment or domestic governments, local governments? And also, how much benefit there is to the farmers, um, both those that grow the crops for biofuel and those that grow for food, um, especially considering how much proportion of income is devoted to food. Um, thank you. So why don't you take that? Okay. Um, yes, certainly in terms of the sources of investment, a lot of, a lot of it has come from uh, foreign investment. Like uh, Roz mentioned, uh, well, well, D1 was a, was, a, was a case of India. There, the CCAB, there's been a lot of, um, actually even south to south investment. So, um, Indian biofuels companies have also been investing in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I would expect to see, I know that Embrapa, the uh, National Agricultural Research Corporation of Brazil, has been working uh, in Angola. They've been looking more in terms of maybe more through the sugar cane technologies uh, and, and those cane technology signs. And some of those ventures, uh, again, maybe from the Brazilian point of view, they're more interested in introducing technologies that improve the productivity of feedstock for biofuels or other uses, but I think that route will probably have more beneficial spillovers if those technolo technological agronomic improvements spill over into the food producing sector. And I think uh, studies have shown that whenever you have investments 
that increased productivity, especially for staple grains, you do get a reduction in the benefit in poverty. Um, the benefits to farmers, of course, will depend very much on the structure of how those investments are made. Uh, I have colleagues who have done uh, experimental sort of economic experiments to sort of see if you have a centralized biofuels operation which is mostly focused around producing your feedstock on a plantation versus one which is more decentralized involving outgrowers where there's potentially more use of mobilization of labor that the latter will probably have more of a poverty, poverty reducing effect just because your you, uh, the, the households will earn um, and especially, it, they'll learn even more if there's those positive spillovers that they're getting technologies through their outgrower contract arrangements that en enable them to produce not only better biofuel crops, but better food crops. Uh, but then also that even for those who don't have land but are landless laborers, that mobilization of wage labor can be positive. Um, but again, the nature of those contracts will vary, you know, how that is done will ultimately affect who benefits because um, again, if it's done at the expense of people's access to land and livelihoods, then um, obviously those who are involved in the scheme might benefit, but those who somehow are left out, uh, whose tenure or access to land wasn't properly documented and is somehow usurped by these uh, adventures, um, might not benefit. From what from, from some field work that uh, some colleagues have done in Mozambique and Tanzania, I, I think uh, they, they've, they've uncovered that sometimes the risk that farmers face is from the biofuel ventures that have failed. A venture came in, said we're going to set aside this much land. Um, you know, people made a commitment. They, you know, maybe they delayed or they, they, they didn't grow something in order to grow this biofuel crop. The venture failed, and they're left with you know how many acres of, of detrofa that they can't sell. I mean, that might be a, a more real risk to a lot of farmers. In terms of what the biofuel risk is, it may just be through the international price effects. Um, and, and so there's two sides of the risk that they face and two sides of the p potential benefit. Those higher prices could be to their benefit if they're net consumers um, or, or, or if they're somehow involved in the scheme. And I would just you know, want to add that um, really what a lot of sub-Saharan African countries are looking for is this external investment in agriculture and they're seeing this as, you know, this is one way that they are getting external investment. Um, but linking it back to Tom Jane's talk last time where we had so many of the poverty in the smallholders that are confined to this, you know, customary land, you know, if you don't have the kind of smallholder operations, um, whether or not we can go to large-scale agriculture with everyone employed and have that work, like Collier um, says, I think is uh, a big question. And I, I wouldn't say that that's probably going to be the easiest way to get everyone out of poverty. So I think the, the, you know, the deals are being made, and it's going to be a really interesting question to see the big versus the small. Mm -hmm. We're going to give you each the chance to have the last word, and it's only one word, OK? And, 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 here, and here's the question. Five years from now, what percent of the U.S. corn crop will go to ethanol? It is now 40%. Five years. Hmm. 40%. <laughs> I'd say 45%. 45%. <laughs> Those are very telling answers, I think, in terms of how it's how the, the future may look very differently in, the, in the, the next 10 years than it has in the last 10 on, on the whole role of corn-based ethanol in the United States. I think that's a good way and a puzzler and a good way to end this session. I invite you to join me in thanking Roz and Siwa, uh, and then outside for wine and hors d'oeuvres. Thank you both very much for a great day. <laughs>